Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Welcome to this Wednesday afternoon devotional as we continue to look at our sermon series, Unraveled. Looking at how God weaves us back together when our plans unravel, when life unravels due to issues in our life, the pandemic, or whatever it is that causes our loose threads to be pulled. This Sunday's scripture comes from the Gospel of John and is a familiar story for most people who have read the Bible, but we will be looking at it from a new light and a new angle in this unraveled shame. And From the Gospel of John, chapter 4, Jesus in Samaria. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to the Samaritan city of Shechem, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. Jesus responded, If you recognized God's gift and who is saying to you, Give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water, so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So our story today, as we look at the Samaritan woman, as we look at Jesus talking to somebody that was really considered an outcast, according to the strict Jewish idea of where to go and where to be. First of all, let let you know that when Jesus picked a path to go through Samaria to get to Judea, he was picking the fastest route. Not the most pleasant, not the easiest, but the fastest. This is going through a little bit more hilly country, a little bit more rocky area, a little bit more arid than going down the Jordan Valley, which is the preferable, leisurely way and enjoyable way of getting from Galilee to Judea and the Jerusalem area. So going through this city in Samaria, which is now Nablia, uh, it is the heart of the financial district in the Palestinian West Bank area, he chose the fastest way, even though Samaria was a place where good-minded Jews did not go. Because the Samaritans and the Jews, even though they both followed and read and believed in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they had a disagreement. And it's interesting, it's a disagreement that I think sounds awful familiar to modern day churches and denominations. They disagreed on where God's mountain was. They didn't disagree about what was written. They didn't disagree about the five books of the Pentateuch. They just agreed to, disagreed about the location of where Moses was when he got the Ten Commandments. And thus, they became separated. Sounds an awful lot like church wall color. Carpeting color. All those things that have caused the church to divide. And including into this modern time when we as a society decide to divide. Wear actually, a mask or not wear a mask. I think it actually has more to do, like, more connected to church's disagreements over communion. Yep, that would be that yeah. would be a bigger one. And baptism. That is sort of split people, um, like Catholics and Protestants. Right. If we're looking at the bigger scheme. I'm, it, uh, but it was, a, it was a disagreement within an original body of followers that caused them to split and thus became suspicious of one another. Now this is further enhanced by the fact that Jesus shows up at noon at this well. 
sends his disciples off to find uh, food and lodging and, and accommodations and that type of thing. And during that time, this woman shows up. Now, it's very uncommon, one, for a woman to show up at noon because it's the hottest part of the day. Gathering of water, which was one of the main jobs of the females in the family hierarchy, was to gather water because it was something that just didn't come out of your faucet. You had to go and get it, carry it back in large containers. And so they did that either early in the morning or late in the afternoon and evening when it was cooler and more convenient. But this woman showed up at noon when it was hot. The other reason that it's suspected that she showed up at noon is part of the well scene was an awful lot like social media of our time. It's where you went to get the gossip. It's where you went to get what was going on in your community. You showed up at the well to hear from everybody that showed up in the morning and everybody that showed up in the afternoon what was going on. So if you wanted to avoid that, if you wanted to avoid the possibility of being talked about, then you went at a different time. And thus, this woman who shows up. Now we get to the well itself, which is important because this is called the well of Jacob. The Samaritan woman tells us that. Something you need to know, <coughs> excuse me, the well of Jacob is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's only mentioned here when we get to the New Testament. And part of that is because it is claimed to have been part of the land that Jacob purchased while traveling through this area of the country, a place where he would raise cattle and sheep and probably dug a well. And thus, she is informing them that their great patriarch had purchased this land, had put this well in so that it was there for all to use, and that Jacob drank from it, his children drank from it. And how dare Jesus kind of question what's going on because obviously in her mind, Jacob was far more important than Jesus. She had little or no clue. And it's interesting that when she says, how are you going to get water? You have no bucket. Well, this well, just to let you know, is still there. It's inside a church. There has been a church built on that site since somewhere around the year 200. It was easily identified and uh, venerated as a holy site early on in Christianity. But this well is 135 feet deep. That's a long ways down. You're not going to get water out of it by reaching down with a ladle. You're not going to get down there by just reaching down with a cup. You're going to need a bucket and a rope. And I want to show you, um, this is what the well of Jacob looks like now. Inside the church, of course, it's been prettied up so that you can uh, worship around it. And it is a place that you can go and feel closer to where Jesus was and where Jesus made his first proclamation of I am. And there is a well. Now, it's not a wooden bucket. There's a nice, shiny, galvanized bucket. But you can still draw water from that well. It is still actively working and is a part of that church. So today, as we are looking at what it means to be in connection with this scripture, this woman has dealt with shame, and we'll learn more about that tomorrow. She's coming at an odd time. Jesus has broken protocol in order to do what he is doing. Jesus will make some professions and some claims that will change the life of those around them. Even though they, this woman is in isolation and in separation, and even though she's dealing with issues, social issues that cause her to be in great pain, her life has been unraveled, and Jesus is going to give us the word. And he's already started by saying, this, I bring you living water, which the literal translation means, I bring you spring water. I, may, I bring you flowing water. And of course, that's the way the woman takes it, because then she says, well, give me this water so that I never have to come here again. So she makes the right request for the wrong reason, because Jesus, of course, is offering salvation, water that will bring about her unending life as a follower of Jesus. And so that's where our story leaves us today. As we look at the life around us, for us seeking that life-giving solution for all of our issues as our life unravels, whether it's by shame or isolation or pandemic or other issues in our life, God is there to continue to reweave and to offer us that living water. So we have 
your update from last week till now, and Yes, we have had 972,000 deaths in the world, of which 201,000 are in the United States, of which 1,293 are from Iowa. We've had, a, we now have a total of 31.6 million cases that have been diagnosed globally, 6.9 diagnosed in the United, 6.9 million diagnosed in the United States, and 82,168 cases in Iowa. Muscatine County had quite an increase in the last 24 hours. We've been having four, about four a day um, since last week, but in the last 24 hours we had 15 new cases. Cedar County has had about two to three to sometimes four cases in the last several days. It had five new cases in the last 24 hours, which brings our two-week cumulatives, increases, increases them. Muscatine County now, two weeks, has, 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 has had 76 new cases, and Cedar County, 46 new cases. Hospitalizations are over 300, whoops, 301, um, and 37 people on ventilators. We have now 41 new, or 41 total long-term care mm. out, uh, facility outbreaks. Steve has rung the bell 22,793 times. Yep. We're coming up on the 180th day of doing that uh, next Monday. Um, so there may be a Facebook broadcast of that just as a commemorative. Um, as we go into our prayer time and prayer requests, um, along with the data that Ann was sharing with you, one of the new long-term care facilities is the call home. And, of course, we do have a member, Kathy Luthie, who is, a, is at the call home. And so keep her in your prayers because... Uh, it's been hard enough to be in a care center when there is a, an outbreak, but it, or when before the outbreak, but even then when they become uh, a local hotspot, things become even more difficult inside the building. So keep Kathy in your prayers uh, as they deal with that. We wanted you to keep in your prayers. We got a text message this morning from Connie and Tom Zeleny. Their son-in-law has been diagnosed with COVID-19. So keep him in your prayers as we uh, move forward. Melanie and Leroy. Melanie Leroy's son was exposed to COVID-19, but he came out negative. So that, that is a joy that we can lift up. That is also the husband of their daughter-in-law, who is eight months pregnant and dealing with uh, some issues to get through this last month. So that family really needs their, their prayers uh, wrapped around them intensely. Terry's uncle. Ter Oh, sorry. Terry's <laughs> uncle. I'm remembering all these names. It's okay. I have them all. Anywho, it's all right. Okay. Uh, Terry's uncle, Ron, uh, continue to keep him in your prayers as he's dealing with COVID-19. We want to continue to keep uh, a new prayer request that came up on Sunday. Penny McKillop has asked for prayers for her brother, Dave Holiday, who had a heart attack last Friday and two stents put in and is now recovering. But to keep him and the family in your prayers. Of course, we want to continue to keep... Jim Lincoln, who had two stints put in last week in our prayers, as well as Don Hartman, who is in the hospital for some gallbladder issues. They're all home now, and so continue to keep uh, praying over them as they recover, and I'm sure they'll have some physical therapy and some other things to do along that line. Uh, Greg Brown, as we uh, had a valve replacement, so keep him in your prayers. Of course, continue to pray for all those that are dealing with radiation and chemotherapy. I know Turk went in to have his port put in, to start chemotherapy and we want to keep him in his prayers as that is a, a new process for him in his life. We had some great pictures on Facebook of Diane Budding enjoying a few kayaking moments as she continues to deal with the process but keep her in prayer. She has tough days, she has good days but we want to uh, continue to uh, remember them and to watch over them. Of course we want to keep praying for those that have had falls and physical therapies, broken bones. Uh, keep our prayers to those that are in the schools, the school systems as they deal with COVID-19 and the ins and outs of that. I saw that there's a, been some major changes to homecoming at Wilton. It's not canceled, but they're going to have to do without a parade and do without a few other things because it just isn't safe. Continue to keep our firefighters locally, of course, in our prayers, but also those on the West Coast dealing with that devastation. All those that are dealing with storm aftermath between Beta and Sally and the Doratio, uh, continue to watch over them. Cedar Rapids is going to be a long time recovering. 
they just announced that there's over 1 billion pounds of tree debris removed from the streets of Cedar Rapids. And that's wow. just, it's just so hard to imagine. And of course, our farmers, as they deal with trying to harvest damaged crops, as they deal with crop insurance, the drought, we've gotten some rain, but of course that doesn't really make up for any of it. So there's a lot on our hearts today. So we want to keep all of that in our prayers as well as each other, as well as lifting up your own issues and problems that cause you to suffer a little bit more these days, as well as the strife and the division that is going on in our country as we come towards this time of election. We need to keep prayers for everybody to remain open-hearted, open-minded, remain calm, and to listen to what God is asking them to do. So with all of that, let us pray. Lord, we ask that you continue to pour out your blessings upon us, that you may allow us to feel your presence, to experience your grace. Lord, I ask that you pour out calm upon this country, upon this time, and upon this place. Be with those who are hurting physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. Lord, be with us as we continue to try to be your hands and feet to this hurting world. Lord, there are people like that Samaritan woman in our community, in our lives that are seeking wholeness, that are seeking to be wove back into the fabric of this community. Lord, often we have been unraveled by things like shame and isolation, disease and injury, separated by finances and ideologies. So Lord, help us to heal, to heal within ourselves, to heal within our community. Lord, we ask that you continue to pour out your healing blessings upon those who are dealing with the aftermath of surgeries and heart attacks, recovering from accidents and falls. Lord, we ask that you be with those that are in the care centers, that are separated and alone, those that are isolating in their homes alone. Lord, be with each of us as we prepare, as we protect, as we love our neighbors, as we want to be loved by wearing our masks, by washing our hands, by doing what is necessary to bring, to bring healing and health back to our communities, back to our church. Lord, I ask that you pour out your spirit upon those that will be gathering next week in our church council to look at the future and decide what we're, where we need to go and what we need to do. Help us to be good stewards for each other, for the building, and for your mission and ministry. So Lord, we thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and the miracles that we will claim in the days, weeks, and months ahead. We thank you for all of this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to go away from our devices and back into our community or back into our household chores or what it is that God is calling us to do today, I would remind you to join us again tomorrow at 3. Share this link with other friends and family if you think it would be helpful. And remind you that we will be worshiping Sunday morning at 1015. You can join us in the parking lot, in your car, and listen on the radio, sit in your lawn chair, just wear your mask as you get to your spot of uh, sitting. You can also be on Facebook Live at 1015. This week, I'm also probably going to be putting up at 1015 on YouTube a pre-produced worship service that is will be smoother and higher quality than the live feed. And then, of course, 7 o'clock, you can work, join us for worship at that time, too. So there really is four ways that you can join us in worship this coming Sunday. So remember, God loves you. Ann and I love you, and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Peace be with you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice.